What's going on fellow art warriors? Welcome back to another Art Bros tutorial video. This time I am going to be painting this uh, female elf and what I'm going to be focusing on for you guys is showing you guys how to break down the light and shadow planes on a figure so that you can very easily identify the big shapes when you start painting so you can save yourself a big headache as you continue to render. And this is the way that I tend to be thinking while I am painting um, really anything. I start with the biggest shapes I possibly can and then continue to detail as I go on. And for me, it's just a really easy way to have a sort of step-by-step -step process and really have a place to go back to to understand um, where the light is and where the shadow is. So if you guys end up liking this video, please uh, uh, be sure to subscribe and also throw us a like. It really, really helps us out. But let's rewind and show you guys how I did this. All right, guys, so let's get into this. So the reason I chose this reference in particular to study is there's a very clear distinction between light and shadow and warm and cool colors. And the best way to approach a study like this is thinking about the big, big shapes. And what I wanna do is actually, I'm gonna draw on the reference first to talk about this. And this isn't exactly the way I paint, but it's the way I think while I'm painting. And for you guys, especially more beginner artists, if you can get into the habit of thinking like this very early on, then you're gonna see really huge improvements as you continue to get uh, better with your technical skill. So, um, all right, let's take a look at this. So it's hopefully pretty obvious that the light is coming in, let me get a brighter color maybe. The light is coming in from this direction, kind of like from her back, back right. <laughs> and it's lighting the side of her face, it's lighting her neck, her shoulders, her hair, blah, blah, blah. But what I actually wanna do is be thinking about her almost like a 3D model and thinking about the planes that the light hits and where those planes shift and where they would drop off into shadow. So let's maybe plot out the light first. So I'm actually gonna be drawing where I'm seeing the biggest portions of light hitting the figure. So I'm gonna block out the light and then I'm gonna block out the shadow. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about occlusion shadows before I even start painting. All right, so we have our light blocked out. Let's work on our shadows. Okay, so what's very interesting about this is obviously like her whole face is lit, but that's because there is this cool blue sky pointing directly down and all around her, right? So you get that blue light bouncing kind of everywhere. Obviously the sunlight is stronger than the skylight, so it's overpowering these portions of her body. But if we just like turned off the skylight, pretty much um, the whole other side of her face would be completely in shadow. The reason that um, we're kind of getting this smooth transition from light to shadow is because, like I said, think in planes, these planes aren't uh, harsh edges. There's no like, you know, it's not like a cube where you'd get one side lit by sun and then it's such a harsh angle that this side would be completely in shadow. So instead what's happening is the light is actually doing what's called fall off. Like the light is transitioning as it wraps around the form. And because it's on the back side of her, it's rounding around those edges. So you can see it primarily on her forehead. You're actually getting more of a distinction on her nose because her nose kind of is what we talked about, like a cube. It's got like more of a harsh angle to it, but you're seeing it on her, on her whole body as well. It's kind of like across her chest. This is transitioning from light to more of a cool color on her left shoulder where the light can't reach as far. The last thing that I wanna talk about is occlusion shadows because I think a lot of uh, you know, newer painters 
miss out on this and an occlusion shadows really really make a difference in making your image pop and feel three-dimensional so what is an occlusion shadow basically it's any area where the light like has a really tar hard time hitting or just can't hit it all so if you press your hand together you see that occlusion shadow between your your fingers so i'm going to plot those out in red so i'm seeing one right here there's kind of one right here behind her ear in between her hair you'll see this a lot in hair right because we're thinking about hair in like big chunks and the the hair strands kind of like overlap each other and these are all basically occlusion shadows so I'm see here and over else kind of like in the crevices of the eye that's that's more or less a cast shadow but there there would be an occlusion shadow right where those piece of fabric kind of push up next to each other right here as well okay so we might as well talk about cast shadows since i just mentioned that too maybe plot that out in green a cast shadow is an area on an object that's getting blocked by the primary light source so right now we're seeing a cast shadow happening on her neck it looks like her her hair is blocking that sunlight right and it's casting a shadow along her neck you'll also typically see this on a forward facing light let's see in my image uh, there's kind of one happening my chin is kind of blocking my neck right and it's casting a shadow underneath there as i mentioned before this is more or less a cast shadow and uh yeah those are the the nose is also kind of casting a shadow but because we have this bright blue dome light like all around her it's it's filling in those shadows with that cool light if that makes any sense so that's why it's not just like completely black and i think a lot of uh, artists would tend to be like oh i know the hair is blocking the neck so i'll make this a really really dark value but you have to consider the fact that there's like this warm light uh, let's let's pick a last color that's just like bouncing around everywhere right it's bouncing from her chest back onto her neck from her shoulder back onto the bottom side of her chin that's why you're seeing some of these warm lights so we've plotted out all of our really really big basic shapes i know this looks a little bit like a mess but we can we can very easily break these down into huge portions and you'll see when i go into my painting as well this is how i'm going to start off blocking out everything and then the detail is is pretty much just going in and blending and making sure we're uh rendering all of our textures and materials and stuff like that all right but for now i'm going to turn that back off i'm going to put my reference back to full color so i can get a good idea of what everything is actually looking like i'm really quickly going to just zoom out so that i can see the full image and what i like to do first um first off i always start with a really quick sketch for these it's not super important that it's like exactly like the reference i'm more focused with this study on ensuring that my light and shadow are looking really really good and my colors are good so what i'd like to do is block out the background first i'm going to pick more of like a yeah, let's pick this one this is a fun kind of painterly sort of brush i'm actually going to tint the whole canvas a cool blue because I think that's the primary color of the background and the reason guys that I, I try to block out the background first is that the background colors tend to inform the colors that are happening on the figure Alright, at this point, I'm trying to make sure I'm not going 
super detailed with everything. I'm being a little bit more expressive with my paint strokes. I'm just trying to lay down enough of a base so that I have uh, color information to pull from. So let's get into the character. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna block her all in with a solid flat color. And then as you'll see, as you'll see, we are going to block out those big shapes like we talked about. And I wanna to mention too, with my client work, I'm a lot more meticulous with, you know, making separate layers and making sure my edges are really, really sharp and stuff like that. And then I end up getting a little bit more painterly as I go. But with these studies, it's fun for me to just kind of let my hand loose, be a little bit more free. And what I think that also does is it allows me to learn in a quicker capacity without like really overanalyzing every single little step I'm taking. Um, I, I have enough of a step-by-step -step process of sketch, background, flat character, you know, then rendering out the character that, you know, I at least have some sort of process. But um, yeah, it's fun with the studies to just be a little bit more loose with everything. All right, at this point, we can really focus back on the character. As you see, I turned this light shape layer thing back on so that I can kind of see where I'm working. And I'll probably just be turning that on and off just so I can make sure I'm following my shapes the best I can. So I'm actually having a little bit of a hard time understanding exactly what's going on in the chest area um, because obviously I wasn't there to photograph this picture. Um, so what you kind of have to do is use your best judgment in terms of understanding or at least trying to understand like what's actually going on. I'm seeing right now uh, there's, it, it almost looks like a cast shadow here. So I don't know if maybe there was something in front of the light, like a tree branch or something like that, that's casting a shadow, or if this is just a dark part. These are like dark parts of the fur um, vest. I'm not totally sure. I'm just seeing some of this blue light here. But these are the kinds of things that even if you're a very experienced artist, you might run into. And you kind of have to just use your best judgment and try your best to uh, block out this light and shadow. All right, so I essentially have a light map that's more or less accurate to the reference. Um, very clear distinction between this warm color and the cool color, the light and the shadow. I'm gonna go in and just kind of plot these, uh, these uh, occlusion shadows like we did in the reference and then see where we go from there. All right, so what's actually really cool about this is that you'll see if I turn my my line layer off, we're starting to get the form of the figure with the just three colors. We've got this warm light, we've got the cool light, and then we have these occlusion shadows, which are kind of describing where all of these really tight uh, forms are pinching together. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm going to kind of sort of paint over everything but this gives me an extremely good base of, um, of understanding my form and where these lights and shadows are transitioning. So again, like I maybe wouldn't necessarily start this way every single time I do a painting, but I did this to show you guys how, how, how easily you can describe uh, realistic forms with just a couple colors. All right, now let's get into the painting part. I wanted to mention again because I'm painting this part the reason that the neck is still warm even though this is essentially a cast shadow that's happening is because there's all this light this warm light bouncing around in there whereas on on her uh, left cheek for example there's no other object that's bouncing that warm light back onto her face so it's pretty much just straight skylight that's hitting her face
Okay, I wanted to talk about this uh, fur jacket as well. I think a lot of artists would have the tendency to just be like, oh, I'll get a fur brush and try to paint that. And what my strategy is gonna be is try to look for those big shapes of color like we've been talking about before, blend them out into almost more of a softer matte material. It's almost gonna look a little bit mushy at first, but then as I tidy stuff up, I'm going to um, do some uh, blending trickery to kind of get some of that fur material. And we'll talk about that once we get there. Alright, at this point I'm pretty happy with my underpainting, I'm relatively happy with my colors and everything feels pretty blocked in. This is a good point to just take a step back, take a sip of coffee, and analyze your painting. Alright, so this is, this is pretty much the same strategy I use when I do a client piece as well. I'll do kind of an underpainting under my lines, block it up enough so that I know what the heck is going on, and then I will start painting over top of my lines, or depending on the painting, I might just like remove my line layer and use it as a reference and paint opaquely. But I think in this case, my lines are doing like a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the, the shape and the form, so I'm gonna leave them. But what I did do earlier is I set them to a multiply layer. I'm gonna just lower the opacity on that just a little bit so I still have them as a reference, but I don't want them so dark that they're like interfering with the colors of my paint because when you mix black with colors you don't want to be gray, um, it ends up not being great. So what Multiply does is it kind of allows like some color information to pop through, especially if you lower the opacity. I'm also gonna be brave right now and just uh, <laughs> merge my layers. I'm gonna make a duplicate just in case, but I'm gonna merge my layers. It actually looks like this is like semi-transparent too. Let's see what happens when I, yeah, I kind of gave it some more pop as well. Okay, perfect. All right, I think this gives me a really good base. I'm gonna just start painting over and uh, at this point, just looking at my reference rendering, and um, yeah, I'll let you guys know if I run into any other trouble. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple things right now. So first of all, I switched to my mixing brush, which kind of helps me blend my paint a little bit better. I found myself uh, taking a little bit too long just to block stuff in, and this kind of helps speed up my process a little bit. Um, the other thing too is I am going to check my values. So I go to my adjustments layer, I click on black and white, that puts my image in black and white, and then also I'm gonna do this on the reference. And we can very clearly see that I'm not quite hitting some of my bright values. Everything's feeling a little bit too muted um, on my end. Her eyes are also looking just a little bit too big. Um, I'm not caring too, too much about how stylized this ends up being. Again, I'm more caring about uh, color and light and stuff like that. But I might want to fix that. Um, oh, last thing too, let's flip our image just so that we can kind of see if anything is looking super wonky. So I have this set up to a hotkey. Um, 
gonna have to go into your preferences to do that. Yeah, I like the positioning of her face and everything. Um, looks pretty solid. It's just uh, her eyes look kind of weird right now. So, all right, let's get back to it. Okay, two things I wanted to note. One is that when you use the mixer brush, sometimes it's kind of hard to get more of a hard edge. Um, if that's the case, because it kind of feels like you're smearing around like wet paint. If that's the case, you just switch back to your, your normal like opaque brush with transfer or whatever, and you can kind of lay down some more hard strokes. The other thing is we were talking about painting fur. So what I'm going to be doing is using my mixer brush. It kind of, when you pull it in, in a direction, it almost gives like a bristly sort of feel. So I'm, I'm pretty much just using this one brush, which is just a square brush, to go and paint in this fur texture more or less. And I feel like I'm getting a pretty good result and it's, it's still feeling cohesive with the rest of my painting. The thing that you'll see quite a lot of when you start using those like stamp brushes is it just looks so obvious that you used a stamp brush and ideally you want your painting to feel like one solid piece. Even right now for me, the background's feeling a little loose. I'm probably gonna go back in and touch it up with my mixer brush so that I can kind of get some of the same sort of textures going on or I might just blur the background, I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, but um, I would recommend probably just using, I don't know, one to three brushes, especially when doing studies, just to try to, just to try to get used to the brush you're using and, um, and try to figure out how to utilize it the best way you possibly can and try to emulate different materials with that just one brush is gonna be really good practice.
All right, guys, at this point, I'm very happy with how the painting turned out. Um, I'm at the point right now where I could just sit there and really, really detail everything, like there's the buttons on her shirt and really make sure all the materials are looking right. But I think this is a solid enough piece, especially for a study that, um, yeah, I'm happy with the result. And I feel like I learned a lot um, about color and light and plotting out my shapes and shadows and stuff like that, that uh, I can call this one done. If this was a client piece, this would probably be the stage where I'd consider this like 80 to 90% where I would like take a step back for a couple hours or maybe even a whole day and then come back to it and polish it up and make sure everything is like as rendered as possible. But um, yeah, especially for a study, you could definitely leave a piece at this point. So yeah, guys, thanks so much for watching this uh, video. I hope you guys learned something today. Um, this was a lot of fun for me, and I this is actually how I think about um, plotting out my lights and shadows when I'm painting. So uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hit me up in the comment section. I'll be sure to respond. But uh, otherwise, keep on drawing, everyone. See you guys next time. Perfect.